Well, joining me now from Durango, Colorado, is Benjamin Waddle, a, an associate professor of sociology at Fort Lewis College. And from Tucson, Arizona, is Chuck Kaufman. He's the national coordinator of the Alliance for Global Justice, an American nonprofit organization working for social change and economic justice. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. Um, Benjamin, let me start with you. Is President Ortega as unpopular as he's ever been? You know, I think that's a really good question. I think Ortega was unpopular in the late 1980s as the economy was uh, tanking. Um, but I think if we look at recent moments in history, since Ortega returns in 2006, um, there hasn't been a point at which he's been um, more unpopular. He retains about 25% of his base in recent polls, um, and that ranges between 25 and 30%, which is historically below the amount that he got in elections in the 1990s and in 2006. Um, when you had international polls uh, following the election. So um, he wins the presidency with about 36% of the vote in 2006, uh, comes into power in 2007. Currently, he's hovering around 25% in terms of popularity. So I think it's arguable to say he's at a low point in his history of nearly four decades in power. Right. Chuck, for a lot of people, he crossed the line last year with the violent cra crackdown. Once there was blood on the streets, that was enough. Would you accept that people want to change and need a change? No, I wouldn't. I uh, won the election in 2016 with 72.5% of the vote. Uh, recent polls show he's the fourth most popular president in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, people turned out in record numbers last July 19th. Uh, after the coup had been definitively defeated. And uh, I think Ortega's as popular as he ever was. Chuck, who was behind the coup, in your opinion? Oh, the United States, without a doubt. What sort of evidence do you have for that? The uh, National Endowment for Democracy, the U.S. Agency for International Development have poured millions of dollars into Nicaragua o over all of the years. In 2006, I took a delegation down in advance of the election and met with the International Republican Institute, and they admitted that they created the movement for Nicaragua, which was supposedly a non non-partisan uh, non uh, NGO. We met with Ambassador Trevelli. He said he had between seven and eight million dollars to spend on the election. I think it's, it's pretty clear. Okay, so let me ask you, Benjamin, when you hear what Chuck has to say, is there any value to that, that yes, the United States is pushing for change, for regime change, outside of the democratic processes of Nicaragua? Yeah, no, of course. I think what one has to take into account is the United States has spent much more in neighboring countries in recent years. 2006, the United States spends a great deal of money on the ground in Nicaragua, trying to curb a wave of support towards Ortega in those particular elections. Ortega ends up winning those elections by very slim margin, um, comes in democratically elected as president of Nicaragua after uh, nearly a decade and a half out of power. But when we look at the current situation in Nicaragua, I think it's important to keep in mind that Ortega's um, support has slipped over the years, and participation in those elections has also slipped. Record turnout in 2006, in 2011, and 2016, you see slipping numbers. Many polls have people turning out at less than 30 percent. Um, that is less than 30 percent electorate coming out in 2016. And so although Ortega wins by a large margin, um, it seems that very few people are actually engaging in those elections. Right. And so I don't know if we necessarily use that as a, you know, a measuring stick for whether or not Ortega is popular. In terms of the United States' support for movements in Nicaragua, the United States, unfortunately, since 1823, when the Monroe Doctrine was passed, which was just mentioned by the Trump administration, um, has played a heavy hand in Latin American politics. I think the question becomes, why in Nicaragua and not in other countries that have received support from NED mm -hmm. and USAID? And so that I would be interested in knowing what Chuck has to say about that. Yeah, Chuck, let me ask you about one of the promises from Ortega, promising to release more than 600 political prisoners, or what they call the remaining political prisoners, 640 political prisoners. Isn't then the obvious question then, well, why were there political prisoners in the first place? This doesn't suggest that this was the freest of places, does it? 
Oh, where did you get that number 640? The Red Cross came up with 200 and some, all, uh, all but 50 of which have been released already as part of the right. the uh, negotiating process. Is the uh, these these were people who committed major crimes of arson and murder, mm -hmm. uh, burning a policeman to death. That if that if you call that political prisoner, then you you have okay. a different definition than I do. So promising to release them then is what a sign of weakness from Ortega because clearly they're very bad people that that he's releasing. Right. Well, I mean they're not just free to roam the streets. They're mostly released to to home. Uh, uh, incarceration, what do you mm -hmm. call that, home detention. Um, that's been a characteristic of Ortega back into the 80s that he tries and tries for reconciliation and makes compromises that some of us mm -hmm. observing from the outside are, are just aghast right. at. Right. Uh, so. right. I, I, I want to ask you, Chuck, about some of the statistics I have from the Inter-American Commission on human rights, where they said at least 325 people were killed in the protests and the government crackdown. And there was a United Nations report in August that said that there were extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, and torture. Do you reject all of that? Oh, undoubtedly some bad things happened and the the objective here should be to find the truth and punish mm -hmm. the people who who were guilty of human rights uh, 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 obstructions. But mm -hmm. it, it happened on both sides, and what the corporate media has done is completely ignore the uh, murders and arson, et cetera, on the part of the opposition. This myth of a peaceful opposition uh, is just that, a myth. Uh, to four days ago, we released uh, an ebook called Live from Nicaragua Uprising or Coup, uh, which is available many places, but uh, on the Alliance for Global Justice webpage, for one, uh, which uh, provides mo much of this uh, uh, evidence that the mainstream media has ignored, including video uh, presentations. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so Benjamin. Is Chuck right that there's violence on the other side as well? Yeah, I know, of course. I mean, there's, I, I think one of the things that happens on April 18th of 2018 is you see a, a massive wave of people rise up against the government um, with which there had been tension against from the beginning in 2006. Ortega takes power with about 36% of the electorate voting in his favor. That means he begins his, his turn as president in 2007 as a minority. Um, president. He was supported by the minority of, of the nation. So he moves forward from that point um, as a president without the majority of the population support. And I think by 2017, when the economy starts to slip and um, investment patterns start to dip, it was clear that Ortega was less popular than um, the polls that he had were reporting. Um, by 2018, when people take to the streets, um, you see all kinds of different factions come out in support of a government change. And so you have peaceful factions, but you also have people that were coming out of neighborhoods that were less peaceful. Um, there was not an organized front. Uh, it was a, a movement that really came up from the streets. Students began it, um, but after it begins on the 18th and 19th of April, it takes on a life of its own. And I don't think there was any one person controlling it. And I think in many ways, that's what helps us understand why Ortega is still in power. Mm -hmm. People don't know mm -hmm. what El Dia Después or the day after would bring. And I think that's largely because there's not a candidate or a person at the, at the head of this movement, um, which makes it very difficult to know what the future would bring if Ortega were to fall. Uh, Benjamin, help me understand, as a former Sandinista rebel, help me understand the kind of emotional hold he has on so many people in Nicaragua. Well, I think if you look at the base, the 25 to 30 percent that continue to support him in polls, I think it's important to understand these are people that gave up their their lives in some cases, or at least their family members did, um, and really dedicated an important chapter of their lives, at the very least, to a movement against the dictator themselves. And so in 1979, when that triumph happens and this creation of a new country um, with new socialist and economic norms takes place, people invested a part of themselves, um, in many cases, 10, 15 years,
to a project. Uh, in the 1990s, there was, this, there was a conservative neoliberal government that comes into power that really made it difficult for those people that supported the Sandinista revolution to find jobs, um, to remain employed, uh, to go to, to good schools. And so by 2006, when Ortega comes back into power, um, I think Tomás Borges, one of the former, former comandantes who passed away in the last few years, he said, at all, uh, the last thing we can do is give this back to the conservatives and neoliberals when they won in 2006. And I think they've held true to that. And I think the base um, has a similar position. The last thing they want to do is turn back mm -hmm. over uh, to a conservative um, opposition. And, and I think you know, that helps us understand the tension between the two sides. Right. And Chuck, when... Uh, there's pressure from the likes of U.S. Senator Marco Rubio and others saying that Ortega must go. What are your thoughts? Like what business is it of his? If the if the Nicaraguan people want to have a change of government, if they want to go back to neoliberalism or or even a Somoza uh, style dictatorship, well, that's the business of the Nicaraguan people. Uh, that our business is to let them make those kinds of decisions without intervention from the United States. And the intervention from the United States has been heavy handed uh, and has now interrupted you know, sustained economic growth of 5% since, since 2007. Uh, Nicaragua was the first one of the first countries to meet the UN millennial goals of, uh, of uh, cutting poverty in half by 2015. Uh, the lives of people have materially improved under Ortega, and that's why he's been reelected uh, twice since 2006. Okay, interesting to see what happens now. Still a lot of people who are angry and on the streets and feel that the anger that they had expressed a year ago has not been answered. A lot of questions. We'll keep a close eye on Nicaragua. Good to cover Nicaragua. We haven't for a long, long time on the Newsmakers. Chuck and Benjamin, thanks for joining us.